Hi, this is Jim Janesey. We're now taking a look at Chapter 21 of the Gombrich textbook, The Story of Art. We're going to be looking at the late 1600s into the 1700s in Italy. Gombrich calls this power and glory. It's about the Baroque era, and the theme here is the theatricality of Baroque church architecture. This period is known as the Catholic Counter-Reformation. What we're talking about here is, as this arrow indicates, Italy, south of the Alps here, and this area northern Europe we'll consider later. Here we have the city of Rome right in the middle of Italy. This is the church of Santa Agnese in uh, Piazza Navona in Rome. This is a very famous church. You might remember a church earlier that was the starting of the Baroque era. Some of the ornamentation here is similar, although this church doesn't have volutes on it. I have a series of slides here I'm going to run through rather quickly to show you the key elements of this church. Here we have doubled columns. All of these columns are pilasters, that is, they're applied to the surface of the church. They're not actually freestanding columns, they're more like decorations. But here we have doubled columns. The Greeks never used them this way, but this is a key element of Baroque architecture. Here we have these funny little roofs over these doors. The curving roof is unknown in Greek architecture, and the central area there, that little oval which might be a window or it might be a stone medallion, is also a decoration that's unknown in Greek architecture. Here we have the traditional pointed roofs that you would find on a Greek temple. The center of this church looks like kind of a small Greek temple, but the idea that we have two little doors on the sides with those types of roofs and one roof like that higher in the middle is reminiscent of a Roman commemorative arch. And here we have an interesting concave shape to the front of this building. The red line that I've drawn here is just an attempt to accentuate that so that you can have a better look at it. This church is farther away at the central door from the front of it than the sides. It's an unusual shape that adds a kind of motion to the, the building structure that you wouldn't have if the front surface was flat. And here we have these two towers, which start off square and then wind up in a roundish shape. This is a very interesting feature of much of Baroque church architecture, and it had not existed on churches in this way in the past. This part of the towers that I'm highlighting here for you is called the entablatures, and as Gombrich points out, they're kind of broken. They don't have a smooth line here. They seem to have kind of an unusual breaking in here, where they are not actually continuous in the same way that the entablatures on a Greek temple would be. So this was an innovation also of the Baroque era. And then the central dome, although domes were known on churches before, this shape of a dome, and once again the smaller oval here pointing out the broken entablature, is very much a feature of Baroque architecture. So this church comes much later than the earlier church that we had seen. It is typical of Baroque architecture as the Baroque era developed. And this is the interior of that church. We can see here that just about every part of the interior surface is covered with some type of decoration. Gold leaf in various areas. The columns are a very colorful type of marble. And up here on the ceilings we have these paintings or frescoes. And even the arch here is decorated. And of course the altar has this kind of interesting decoration to it also. And we'll see the interior churches gets even more theatrical, reaching its culmination with the church in the Monastery of Melk, which we'll take a look at shortly. Here we have one of Bernini's sculptures that's rather different than the sculpture that preceded it. A couple of things about this. First of all, it's set in a small side chapel, so this roof up here actually has an opening to the sun, and the light comes down in this indirect way, and it's kind of accentuated with these gold rods that look like beams of light coming down. From the bottom, we see that it's supported in kind of interesting way. This is rock, but it actually looks like it's floating. It looks like a cloud because it's supported on rock down here that's recessed even farther. So it looks like this really is a cloud just sort of hovering in the air. But of course the key feature here is a Saint Teresa who is in a moment of ecstasy taken up into heaven with this gold arrow piercing her heart. And she has a very dramatic expression on her face we'll take a look at in just a second. But an interesting thing here is the way Bernini arrange these folds of cloth in a very dramatic way. It's not at all like you would see on the Pietà, uh, another sculpture by Michelangelo, that is very realistic in terms of its draping. Here the draping is really rather rough and 
exciting in a different way. It's it's as if it's really in turmoil. There's a lot of expression here of action going on. And here we have the face that was carved by Bernini. This is kind of a, a passionate sort of a an expression here that is much more emotional than the earlier Renaissance period. This is the ceiling of another church that's very theatrical, another church in Rome, the Church of the Holy Name of Jesus. In this church, what's happening is, much like Correggio, who decorated the dome with this sort of an opening of the sky, we have here a very dramatic scene of people on this side being sucked up into heaven as if this were a hole in the roof and here we have people who are being rejected and thrown down they're passing through the church in this case and the way that this is painted with this shadow here these shadows when a person is sitting in this church it's really hard to distinguish that this is not three-dimensional and this isn't really happening but the painting is done in such a way that they use light perspective and they use linear perspective and of course positional perspective in such a way that it's very dramatic and it really makes it seem like this scene is occurring. This is a very vivid example of how Baroque style and architecture was directed at being very theatrical and very dramatic.